Alabama Public TV presents Spotlight on Agriculture. Hello, I'm Stephen Leith, president of Auburn University. Auburn was founded on the twin pillars of agriculture and engineering. And as an agricultural scientist myself, I'm pleased to welcome you to this first episode in a documentary series on agriculture, produced and hosted by Alabama Public Television. Our world is growing at lightning speed. In fact, we have more than doubled the human population in less than 50 years. With this many people sharing the planet, our natural resources are feeling the strain. But these resources are vital to producing the food we eat, the clean water we drink, and the fiber and energy we need for comfortable, productive lives. This is a major challenge in 21st century agriculture, and is a challenge we are rising to meet through research innovation at Auburn. To feed the world, we must protect the environment. We must be good stewards of our natural resources. We must learn to produce more with less. You could say that in agriculture, every day should be Earth Day. For the next hour, you will see how we are applying innovative methods to eliminate pollution that is harmful to our food and water. You will see how we are advancing farm practices to grow yields while shrinking our environmental footprint. And you will see how we are working to involve everyone in these crucial endeavors, whether you work in agriculture or not. We are all part of this world. Let's work together to protect it. From everyone at Auburn University and Alabama Public Television, thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy our program. I was told once, and it's certainly evident, that somebody lives downstream from everyone. So uh, we, we want to be cognizant of that and be as good a stewards here in the city of Auburn as we can with our water resources. And so we've got uh, great people on our staff like Dan Crowdus that uh, worked on this project and uh, made it a success. So the City of Auburn partnered with Auburn University in what was ultimately a year-long design collaboration uh, to design the intersection, which does include the three green infrastructure practices of the permeable interlocking concrete pavers, the silver cell suspended pavement application, and then also the original green infrastructure, our urban tree canopy. Not only is this an intersection where people gather to learn more about what's happening in their town this day, or to celebrate victories, or just to come together as a community from Auburn University and the city of Auburn. It's also an intersection of water. At the top of Toomer's Corner, we start to shed water in three different directions. We have a stream, Parkerson Mill Creek, that flows through campus, Saugahatchee Creek that flows to the north of town, and then Town Creek that flows through the city, the city of Auburn. This intersection has always been important, and over the past 20 years, as innovations in stormwater and water management have improved and technologies have become affordable, and we see a real commitment to quality of life as it connects to how we manage our water, we've seen a lot of improvement and investment from both the City of Auburn and Auburn University. In the southeast, we get frequent, intense rainfalls. 20 years ago, when those rains would come, those raindrops would hit a very hard surface and travel quickly to the nearest storm drain. Imagine yourself as a raindrop, and when you hit the ground, you meet a speck of oil. That raindrop and that speck of oil travel together to a storm drain. Storm drains are something that we walk over and walk by every day and probably don't think much about. In fact, I can't count the number of times I've seen someone with a leaf blower just blowing leaves and trash and whatever was in the way of the street and the gutter right into that storm drain. The secret is that storm drain does not treat water. Most of the time in Alabama, that storm drain goes directly to a stream. It's like a super highway from the street, to the storm drain, to the stream. So you as the raindrop and that little speck of oil, you're not alone. You have millions of friends that have fallen with you and have picked up oil and gas, cigarette butts, 
fast food wrappers. Whatever you see on the street, it has a high likelihood of being picked up and washed right into that gutter, which then ends up in your stream, in your river, and probably your drinking water source for a half of Alabama. There is very little opportunity for an important piece of the hydrologic cycle, and that's infiltration. 20 years ago at Toomer's Corner, this was a flat, hard surface that did not allow for infiltration. So we were shortcutting the hydrologic cycle. Water hits the ground, water runs off very quickly. Now, at Toomer's Corner, we see technologies like permeable interlocking concrete pavers and flow through tree cells that reconnect infiltration so that when water hits the ground, there's an opportunity for it to soak in instead of immediately run off. And that soaking in part plays huge benefits to downstream streams and water resources, both for slowing the water down and for cleaning it up. Stormwater management doesn't have to be standalone. In fact, I think what you'll see as we walk through Auburn University's campus and talk about the city of Auburn is it integrates community well-being, both quality of life and aesthetics. A lot of research has shown that people are healthier and happier in green environments. And also protecting and being proactive with our water resources. The more that we can have clean water as it leaves and goes into streams and rivers, the less we have to treat it for our drinking water. Overall, this Tumors Corner intersection, it was dreamed for public safety, bringing people together as a meeting place and making it accessible. And that inclusion of stormwater into it means that it's about many different things that benefit people every day without them really knowing it. But that secret's there and it's doing a lot of good. Besides the interlocking concrete pavers and the flow-through cells, we'll also take a look today at stream restoration. What happens when all of that stormwater hits the stream and the stream can't manage that energy and it falls apart? So we'll take a look at improving streams, which is just another step in the huge web of water management. Beyond that, we'll take a look at big scale and small scale water resource and stormwater management practices that build on collecting water and allowing it to spread out and soak in. A lot of what we've learned from agriculture conservation has been transformed and adapted to urban environments. So we're building on what we've done in the past and trying to make it work well for these really high intensity rain events that hit these hard surfaces. We are at the Kasich facility, which is located in Auburn University's Research Park. Auburn University has made a commitment to be not just an institution that teaches about innovation, but actually practices it. Here at the Kasich building and the other facilities within Research Park, stormwater management practices as a group known as green infrastructure or low impact development are part of the requirements. These low impact development practices, or again also known as green infrastructure, are designed so that they catch that first flush of stormwater. When you think about when it rains, that first inch of water that hits the ground and washes off carries with it most of the pollutants. So if we design a feature to catch and hold that first flush of stormwater, we can go a long way to improving water before it gets to our streams. The practice I'd like to discuss is a bioretention cell. A bioretention cell is a type of low impact development practice and it has been designed here at the edge of the parking lot for as stormwater washes over the parking lot, runs across this lip, you'll notice there's not a curb and gutter but the water has direct access to what you would think is just a landscaped area. This landscape area has been especially designed to catch and hold that first inch of stormwater so that it transports it safely off of the parking lot and then into a holding area that at big rains almost looks like a swimming pool. It fills up and then slowly soaks in. The benefits of bioretention cells are exactly what I just mentioned. It's landscaping. As this building was being planned and designed, the landscape and how to manage stormwater was also a part of that planning. Professors from horticulture, biosystems engineering, and landscape architecture all worked together to make recommendations 
based on their research from Auburn University and what they were seeing as trends around the nation for better ways to handle water and improve local water quality. The planning looks at the footprint of impervious surfaces, again, those surfaces that don't allow stormwater to soak into the ground. Understanding how much water is coming and how fast it's coming at you means that we can create these landscapes that work for us, getting the right soils, the right slopes, and the right vegetation. This landscape, if designed and maintained properly, will manage itself and become more resilient over time. There's no practice that is maintenance free. So knowing that we have to plan in for maintenance, whether it's removing the top surface of the bioretention cell to really keep that nutrient removal up to speed, or replanting plants if they die back. But it's all very similar to what we would expect in typical landscaping anyway. The Kasich facility also makes use of pervious pavers, similar to what we see at Tumor's Corner. Putting together these different systems means that we get improvement in different ways for stormwater runoff. Those aren't the only two green infrastructure practices though. There's also constructed stormwater wetlands, green roofs, rainwater harvesting. In fact, when I think about large scale and small scale projects, a homeowner can implement a rain garden, which is very similar to bioretention, right in your own backyard or in your own front yard. You can put in a cistern or a rain barrel and catch and harvest rainwater to then use for your garden or even for washing your car. I'm at Town Creek Park in Auburn, Alabama, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about a partnership between the City of Auburn, Auburn University, Department of Environmental Management, and the Environmental Protection Agency. In 2008, all of these groups and many more undertook a, a planning effort to design and understand how to improve a stream that had throughout many, many years, let's say 50 or 60 years, had become downcut. It had eroded to where it was probably six foot deep or more in places. This project, the Stream Restoration Project, took that stream that was very deep and looked at a blueprint of more natural streams that were stable and full of life and full of the right kind of streamside forest that we want, and it copied that. We created a new channel on a floodplain that the City of Auburn Parks and Recreation Department allowed us to pretty much paint our own canvas for this stream. Then we came in and did many of the, the different practices we talked about before, putting in structures to help deflect and redirect energy, and that very shallow stream bottom so that when we get big storm events, because there's neighborhoods in a museum upstream of us, so we know we're going to get a lot of stormwater, that stormwater stages up and flows over the floodplain slowing down. This project is now nine years old and most people who come out here don't even realize what it was at one point, which was a very deep and sized stream that was not as biologically healthy as it is now. And what this means is we've got this nice native forest that supports a nice native understory. It would be fantastic if that was the full and end of the story but with any project, as I've mentioned before and again and again, there's always maintenance. Here at this stream project and many projects all across town and in your, probably in your landscape, there are invasive species that are able to come in and they can create a monoculture. That is, just one species grows really fast and outcompetes all the other species. So from time to time, we've come in and we've done privet poles, We've taken out popcorn trees. We work really hard to maintain and manage the kudzu. Kudzu is probably the invasive plant people are most familiar with. What we'd like to see is a stream system that over time grows stronger, is resilient, and supports a healthy ecosystem that we'd like to see here in this part of the world. This project is not unique in Alabama. It's unique in that we got to plan it and work with a lot of community members here in Auburn but all throughout the state of Alabama, there are similar projects on the coast, in Birmingham, in Huntsville. This is a new opportunity to take a stream and a system that may have been degraded from past neglect or past mistakes 
and transform it to a more healthy, vibrant, resilient ecosystem. The state of Alabama is blessed with water resources. You'll hear over and over again that we've got more than 132,000 miles of streams and rivers, not to mention our wetland resources, our coastal resources, and our reservoir systems throughout the state. These have to be protected and managed well so that we can maintain a high quality of life for us, but very importantly for what is living in the stream. Freshwater biodiversity in Alabama isn't something that you probably talk about at dinner, but it is something we should all be really proud of. Alabama streams have more fish species, crayfish species, mussels, things you've never even thought about, like caddisflies, than just about any other state. We have a real opportunity and stewardship responsibility to protect these streams. What we do at Auburn University through our research and our teaching and our extension system is look at how we can piece together all the different sciences from all across campus for research and understanding the processes, research and understanding the solutions, and then research and understanding how we've done. Have we done a good job with managing our stormwater, with utilizing cover crops, with variable rate irrigation and efficiency? Because all of that translates, at least for me at the end of the day, into healthy stream systems, healthy wetlands, and reservoirs that are important for recreation, an economic driver, and also just that important thing of drinking water. Everyone cares about drinking water and more and more it's on the news of people concerned about the quality of their water. Well, it starts with us and we can all do very small things every day to protect water. We can pick up trash, we can make sure that our car is not leaking oil or gas, we can pull invasive species from the sides of streams and replace them with native plants. And if you want to know more about what native plants, you can absolutely get in touch with us. We've got lists and lists of native plants that we like to see growing on streams. So learning more about what, to, what makes a stream healthy, Alabama Water Watch. It is an amazing program with a cadre of volunteers that take the time to get to know your river and stream resources and how they can continue to monitor and understand how they are behaving. Are they improving? Are they getting worse? And what can we do to make sure that we support these really important stream systems through the state? Yeah, so since being with Water Watch for eight years and really paying attention to what's going on in our state with water quality, I'd say, um, you know, we have had some changes. Things are a lot better than they were, you know, 20 years ago or, you know, even farther back before the Clean Water Act. But I would say when you're looking at water quality, you always have new challenges. So even though maybe some of our problems that may have been related to agriculture in the past aren't as big of an issue, we have growing populations and we have stormwater issues and um, you know all kind of things related to even urban areas. So when you're working with water or really any environmental field, um, your work is never done. There's always something new. So um, you know. As a response to that, Water Watch is always trying to pay attention to those trends and try to provide our volunteers with better ways to understand new threats and how to use their data to, to address those things. One thing that makes Alabama Water Watch really unique and really special compared to even other states' volunteer monitoring programs is that you don't have to have a lab to do your testing. We do have a lab at the Water Resources Center at Auburn, but most of our volunteers, they either take their chemistry kits and they collect the water samples and analyze those at the creek site. So when they go back to their homes, they actually have a data sheet that's complete with their pH, their oxygen readings, their temperature. So then they take that data, and most people choose to enter that online through our data entry portal. It comes to us, then the data goes through a process where it's you know checked to make sure there aren't any big errors. And once we've done that, the data is posted online so that anyone, even people who aren't monitors, can log on, they can create charts, they can create maps that help them to understand our data. So as a result, um, it's, it's a resource to the general public, but we also frequently get requests from agencies, from municipalities, from other universities, from organizations, for us to send them you know, raw data sets that they can use in projects that are aimed at improving water quality. 
For our bacteriological monitoring, our volunteers go out to the stream and they collect their sample at the stream and it's mixed into the special media that we use that they then take back to their homes or, you know, we do have some local volunteers who come to our lab to do this. Um, but you plate those in a petri dish and then they have to be incubated for about 48 hours. So you can have a fancy incubator, but most of our volunteers have made their own incubators using old coolers or old ice chests in a nightlight. So all of our stuff is made so that citizens can do it. You don't have to spend a lot of money mailing, you know, samples because we want to empower all the citizens to take part in this. One of the challenges for any organization um, doing environmental work is to make sure that we're you know, taking advantage of new technologies that help us to get our message out and help us to help our volunteers do a better job of monitoring. So we're trying to do that. We uh, just recently released an app that our certified monitors can use to upload their data and send us their site information. And we also produced a few um, YouTube videos that are instructional. So if you come to one of our workshops, you're getting ready to go out in the field, you want to review how to do your dissolved oxygen test, you can go online and you can check out our YouTube channel. So um, we keep you know, trying to do that. Uh, other challenges to keep our program going strong, you know, the equipment that our volunteers have to use, it's not, it's not super expensive, but it's not cheap for a normal citizen. So this year we've had a great opportunity to partner with the College of Ag at Auburn. They chose us as their Tiger Giving Day project. And so as a result, we were able to raise over $10,000 that's being used to put chemistry kits and bacteria monitoring equipment into our volunteers' hands. And we're excited to see some of these folks who may not have been able to get involved otherwise have that support. We would love for you, anyone who's interested in, you know, going out to the creek and collecting water or going out to the bay and, you know, provide, helping us to provide this service to Alabama, we'd love for you to get involved. And it's really simple. You can go on our website. You can find our workshops that we have listed. You can sign up for one. Most of the time, there's no cost, even though it's a very valuable workshop. Um, and if there's not one that works for you, you can just contact us and we'll do our best to connect you with the trainer. Teachers can come to our 4-H Water Watch workshops. They can get continuing education units and get started with that program too. So call us anytime, email us. We'd love to, to help you out. When Alabama Water Watch started in, in, in the early 90s, we had the opportunity to uh, work with a USAID funded project. And that one opened, you know, opportunities to do the similar work in other countries. We started a big program in the Philippines. We started uh, another program in, in Ecuador and we moved from there into other countries. Uh, Mexico just came about 2005, but it's a great program over there. They uh, have been, you know, getting people to do the same thing that people do here. They go and monitor their streams, their lakes, their ponds. And uh, over there, there are about, you know, uh, almost half of the country are doing it in, in one or another way. It has been interesting that uh, it has been a model for, for other states. Uh, we had, I guess we were lucky that nothing was in Alabama before we started. So the program um, worked out pretty good with the citizens and uh, other states have been calling to us to see, you know, what are we doing that here we are 25 years later. Uh, we have a great program going on in Seattle. Uh, we just got a call from, you know, Tennessee. Some people from Tennessee are gonna come and be trained here. Last week there was a, a workshop uh, in Mississippi. So we have collaboration with uh, all the states around and you know, whoever calls. The data that the Alabama Water Watch has been collecting and accumulating is getting close to 100,000 records. And this involves water chemistry. It's basic water chemistry, but um, some sites, they have data for 20 consecutive years. So there are no other you know, data that is that you know, continuous. So it's very useful for uh, state agencies, for uh, different groups that are uh, looking at how you know, the water is. 
So um, it's, it, the data has been used greatly. I remember learning not long after I started that because of the Alabama Water Watch program, certain streams were discovered to be seriously polluted by um, businesses or whatever, um, and even streams polluted by deteriorating sewer systems, such as under uh, underneath the grounds of Auburn University and and when I know I remember learning that that uh, government got involved in the cleanup of the the stream that was so seriously polluted by by industry and this was thrilling to me that that just regular old people could make a difference go out once a month and and do some testing and wow you know, stuff happens, change happens. Since I've been a water monitor, I have found myself in charge of water monitoring for the lake. And I have hosted classes at my house, house for both chemical monitoring and bacteria monitoring. And I've had an instructor come from Auburn to do the instructing. And uh, we now have numerous um, monitors on the lake for doing both chemistry and bacteria testing. We have about 12 doing chemical testing and 14 now to do bacteria testing. What we have noticed this year for the first time in a long time is we are finding some E. coli this year. We found a lot of it in the spring, not so much during the summer, but I did find a little more last week. Um, there can be many causes. One is that we are the last of the last lake in the chain of six. So it could be, a bacteria could be coming from the lake above us, or it could be from local problems on our own lake. Uh, many times it's due to the influx we have of Canada geese, and we have numerous other wildlife in the area too. So there could be many causes of that. 30 years ago, the Clean Water Act tried to tackle what they call point source pollution that coming from factories, smokestacks, wastewater treatment plants, there's been huge progress in controlling that kind of pollution. The one thing that started Water Watch, though, was that the so-called non-point source pollution that doesn't come out of a pipe was getting worse. And so they realized it takes changes in people's ideas, their attitudes, their skills, their behaviors, and that's why we got our funding to try to do broad-based public education and we have seen that be very successful. We've seen a lot of water cleanup because of citizen action. So it came on strong and it became a model that caught the attention of some international organizations. Shortly after that, we had grants to travel the world. Water Watch went into a global uh, setting. We call it Global Water Watch. We've been in 12 countries uh, and we've traveled the world with a lot of uh, citizen action and groups forming, uh, looking to Alabamians as their model to, to do it right. And at our 25th anniversary, we found out that we have had about 300 active groups. They have monitored over 800 water bodies on 2,500 sites around the state and submitted over 100,000 data records all voluntarily. So our state agencies and others are telling us that it's extremely valuable what they would have had to pay to produce the same results. Also, because our testing is done with EPA protocols, we have the credibility, the reputation for producing valid data that can be used for water resource management. I think that citizen volunteer water monitoring will serve Alabama well into the future because the budgets are tight with state governments, federal governments, and Alabamians have a sense of it's our water, let's take care of it ourselves. So I think that by being those eyes and ears on the water, by observing, by monitoring, by seeing trends, we always ask is our water getting better or worse and why? 
That basic question kind of drives all monitors. And if they perceive a problem, then they know what to do, who to report it to, who to work with to get things fixed. So my lab studies the history of water systems. These systems have been changed over decades, but we didn't really monitor these systems until quite recently. So we need data. We need to go back in time and get those pieces of information that are missing. So my lab collects sediment cores, mud cores from the bottoms of these systems, and we measure things going back in time to reconstruct the ecology and the way that these systems have changed to identify the past to manage for the future. We have no idea what happened in the past. The EPA was not established until the 70s. We did not really place importance on water quality until then as well. But most of these systems changed in the 30s and the 40s and in the 50s, and we need to know that information. So my lab tries to provide what's missing. And we do that through analyzing materials that have built up over time to figure out uh, what has caused change in these systems. This is a sediment core from Jordan Lake that you see behind me. And there's a slight color change here in the bottom of this core. And that color change represents the, the river transitioning into the lake and it, it's, it represents 1928 when they finished the dam that was built behind me. And this material has been traveling down this river system for decades and is storing. And we will take this core back to my lab and we will section it and go back in time and try and figure out what is causing change to this system and how can we, can we alter the materials coming into this system to better manage it for the future. Alabama is a surface water state. So we are dependent upon our rivers, our streams, our reservoirs. We need that water for the future. So to understand and go back in time like my lab does, we can figure out and identify the drivers of what causes that water to be polluted, how that water changes in the past, to figure out, to understand, to manage what that water could do in the future and how we can ensure that it's available and clean and usable for generations to come. So the students behind me are sectioning the core that we collected from Jordan Lake uh, just a few weeks ago. And, and in my hand, I hold uh, the 64 to 66 centimeter section of this core. And we will take uh, these sediments, we will dry them in a freeze dryer system and grind them up and do multiple analyses on them. We will date these sediments to determine uh, what period of time they were deposited in the lake and what that time corresponds to uh, in the history of the land use around it, the agricultural systems around it, the, the development around the lake. And then we can measure uh, various constituents of the sediment, such as nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, heavy metal analysis we'll conduct. Uh, we can look at tiny fragments of charcoal and reconstruct forest fires or, or prescribed burning that occurred in the watershed of this system. And then we'll also extract uh, photosynthetic pigments such as chlorophylls or carotenoids like beta carotene and be able to tell you what type of algae lived in the lake during the time period that this was deposited in the system. We're taking these tools and we are applying them to multiple areas throughout the state of Alabama. We're doing other reservoirs in our lab uh, on the Coosa River. Uh, as well as we're doing coastal bays, uh, Wolf Bay and Perdido Bay. We're collecting sediment cores in those areas to look at how development and coastal development and navigation has impacted sediment input and accumulation of materials. And we're also looking at a subset of, of Alabama's only natural lakes area, which is in the Conecuh National Forest. And we're looking at how forest dynamics have changed throughout thousand year time periods and how human impacts 
have changed those directions and impacted the system as well as just what is the natural history of our state and how has it changed over time. All of these projects have one central goal and that is clean water for the people and the ecosystems of Alabama. And we will take these data and we will add them to other projects. We will add them to monitoring projects and we will add them to people who are modeling uh, the future of water in Alabama to make this complete picture of, of where is the water, how is the water responding to the pressures of modern day and how we can preserve it for the people of Alabama and the ecosystems of Alabama moving forward. So here we have analyzed a sediment sample from one of the cores uh, that we have collected using high performance liquid chromatography which is the machine behind me. And what we do is we extract photosynthetic pigments, things like chlorophyll or beta carotene, carotenoids, these molecules that harvest light. And we, we separate them out and we can analyze them using this machine and this is a, a sample that we've run and each of these lines is a different pigment. It's a different light gathering molecule and it indicates typically each a different type of algae that has lived in the system. So we can collectively understand uh, this data and tell you what type of algae, what type of cyanobacteria, possibly what type of plants lived in the lake going back in time. The Alabama Cooperative Extension System is the combination of ex extension programs at Auburn University and Alabama A&M Universities coming together to deliver research-based information to the citizens of Alabama to help them improve their economy and quality of life. The Alabama Cooperative Extension Service has an office in all 67 counties of the state of Alabama. Last year, 1.2 million Alabamians came to Extension for information to help them with their economy, making some more money, and improve their quality of life. Last year we had 188,000 youth involved in 4-H, and that's in over 500 of our school systems. Alabama's blessed with lots of water. We're blessed with lots of rainfall, we're blessed with lots of rivers. The only problem is that rainfall does not occur uniformly across the growing season. We need to make sure that we can optimize the production of our, of our agriculture through the wise use of our rainfall and the wise use of irrigation. Irrigation will help stabilize those yields across the good years and the bad years so that we don't have the economic downturns that occur in a drought year. The other thing that's extremely important is that we make sure that we manage the runoff coming off of our fields. And so we need to make sure that our soils are never bare, that our soils are always covered with residue or something growing. In Alabama, we're blessed with even warm weather here in November and December and January where we can grow cover crops and things like that. And so it goes back to the, the old adage, never leave it bare. So the Water Resources Center, our mission is to support the research, water research, water outreach, and water education. And when it comes to research, mainly it's focused on drought and climate research. So we look at, uh, look at climate forecast and then project it, what it means to the farmers, what it means to the water resources manager. As an example, many years back, we worked with the city of Auburn. In, uh, if you remember, 2007 drought hit the state pretty hard and uh, we were quite dry that year and many municipalities of the size of Auburn or smaller were running out of water. So we worked with the city of Auburn and we looked at their water system, their supply, water supply and the demand and suggested that if they had used climate forecast, they could have managed their water supply better and could have saved money in the process. Uh, so that's just an example of uh, the drought research we have done or climate research we have done. We have also worked uh, in irrigation area, looked at if farmers withdraw water from the stream, uh, how they can water, water, withdraw water from the stream to make sure that they are not impacting the stream. At the same time, they have water available for irrigation. As an example, you know, if you follow how the climate conditions look in uh, Alabama, you would notice that we get much of our rain in winter months, not as much rain in the summer months, 
So idea that has been floating around for many years in, El in Alabama is that if you withdraw water during the winter months and store in a pond like this one right behind me, then, then you can use that water for irrigation during summer months. So we looked at, uh, we did some research, some modeling studies to figure out how much water might be available for us to withdraw during winter months and how much acreage it would support during summer months. So uh, this research informed us that, you know, on an average, you can withdraw enough water from a stream during winter months to irrigate about 10% of your watershed. Uh, so if you have cropland, 10% of your watershed, your stream would supply enough water to irrigate that 10% of the watershed. The pond uh, behind me was, is an irrigation pond. It was dug long time back to support irrigation on this E.V. Smith Research and Extension Experiment Station. This pond is actually not as big as uh, you might think. This was built many years back to supply irrigation to a very small area. But since then, you know, uh, the irrigation has expanded in, in the, uh, on this experiment station. At, at the current time, this experiment station is, uh, I guess, uh, I believe is uh, supporting irrigation about 175 acres. Uh, but this pond needs to be continuously filled from groundwater. So there is a groundwater well uh, that continuously pumps water to this uh, irrigation pond. And then this irrigation pond supplies water for irrigation. But the hope is that this pond also fills up during winter months and can sub, you know, supplement the water that we receive from the groundwater. Here behind us is an irrigation project we've been working on for a couple years. Um, where we live in the central part of Alabama, we don't have a lot of subsurface water that we can tap into with a, a cost efficient wells to be able to, to irrigate uh, through pivots. So for us, we have to build reservoirs. And so these upland storage projects are basically ponds that don't have a blue line uh, stream on a topo map that goes through the area. So we go and we find sites that are conducive for storing water, but they're close enough to a blue line stream where we can pump that excess winter water and store it into these ponds and then have it for spring and summer irrigation. For us, we've not had a lot of irrigation in central Alabama. And so for us, it would be beneficial to have incentives and programs out there that help us to do that. And so while we're in the process of hoping that, that uh, legislation comes through, we're doing these on our own with some help through NRCS and other government agencies. And uh, this pond behind us, once it's finished, hopefully would have about 75 to 100 acre feet of water in it. And so, which would give us the ability to maybe water, you know, 100 to 200 acres of, of cropland here in central Alabama. And um, for us and for the future generations, water is obviously a really big issue. And so, you know, our concern is with uh, different uh, groups as they pass new legislation that we won't have the ability to do this in years to come or that my children won't have the opportunity to do this. So we're really aggressively working to try to create as much water storage capacity as we can and be as environmentally friendly at the same time. Runoff is a big issue for us, obviously with our cover crops. We're trying to manage erosion and uh, the heavier we make our soils with organic matter and, and just living organisms, that helps to slow that process down. And so for us, uh, managing water is a really big issue. So obviously, as you can see, it takes a lot for us to get it. It's very expensive. Once we get it, then we have different technology out there with uh, irrigation uh, scheduling tools that help us with censoring in the ground and different things that help us to come up with a, um, a schedule or a calendar of when we need to water. So we're doing it the, the most efficient way that we can. Anything that's renewable, obviously, or sustainable has to be managed and maintained. And so for us, uh, water is obviously one of our biggest commodities that we have the least of when we want it. And so it always comes, it's never not come, but it doesn't come exactly when we want it. So, you know, obviously irrigation is a tool for us to hopefully be able to manage through those seasons when water is not coming when we want it to. And so obviously because it's a resource, we need to manage it. And so, you know, from the farming side of it, as well as through the uh, academic side, you see that if we don't take care of it, at some point one day, it will be gone. So for the next generations, you know, my dad did a, a wonderful job in preserving and maintaining and giving me the opportunity to be able to come in with fresh ideas and new technology from a land grant school like our university to be able to implement those. And now with my children coming along and seeing the benefits of the things that we're doing, I would only hope that they could spend the next 30 or 40 years and capitalize on it and even make it even more efficient. Because in this country, we're gonna to have to find a way to feed the world. And by the time our explosion of, 
the population explosion takes place, uh, we're going to need twice, three times the yield off of half the acreage we used to farm for that probably to happen. People got to have a place to live. Water's a key component in that infrastructure. So we're going to be fighting one day to promise people that we're not going to misuse this water and that we're going to use it to grow the most efficient, uh, high yielding, safest crop possible and in, in this country. Well, a lot of people say, you know, I'm not involved in agriculture. I live in town, I work in town, I, I, you know, vacation in town. Agriculture's not part of me. Well, anyone that eats three meals a day, wears clothes, doesn't run around naked, participates in agriculture, whether they know it or not. And, you know, you've got to have it. It's one essential, uh, I don't think anybody wants to get up every day and live on a pill or anything like that. So it's, it's a total essential industry and you know if that industry can be cleaner and neater and you know people are going to live next to it function next to it uh it, it's, it's important to them i mean they everybody should be be concerned about it two real significant changes are uh, one has been in the conservation tillage uh, Planting without a lot of tillage work in the spring has helped save the soil. Each time you run a, a hair across the soil, you burn carbon. And by saving that carbon in the soil, uh, it's easier. Uh, soil slowly improves. Organic matter rises, which helps hold nutrients in, in the soil and holds water. Makes the drop, crops a lot drought, more drought tolerant. And then the, uh, you know, it's worked out it's allowed us to grow corn here much better because we can plant it early and get it made before we get hot in the summertime. And that's, that's important because we have a tremendous poultry industry here in the south and we can help supply them with corn. This year, you know, water hasn't been an issue. Uh, we've actually had excessive rains and been damaged by it. And the, the rise in the organic matter has made a big difference. We have one particular farm that, you know, had corn on it last year because of the corn stalk residues this year uh, and the fibrous root system of the corn, you know, it was able to withstand the heavier rains. It's on very, very heavy soil and not, not drown or be stunted and had, had, that, had an excellent cotton yield. So this, uh, these things that were, hap were happening are really helping in both directions. Uh, you know, a lot of soils, drought's a problem. A lot of soils, excessive water's a problem. So it kind of, kind of goes both ways. Alabama farmers not only care about crop production, they care about the environment. That's the reason because they are constantly looking at practices and technology that allows them to increase efficiency. In, it's not only higher yields, it's also how we can produce a crop by using environmentally sound practices. They are constantly looking at the adoption of cover crops, conservation tillage, because they know they can improve soil health. And by improving soil health, they can use probably less nutrients, less fertilizer, less water, and that's going to result into higher yields. They are also looking not only at irrigation, they are looking at irrigation strategies like variable rate irrigation and sensor technology that allows them to apply the right irrigation rate at the right time at the right location. They are also looking at how they can store water during the winter. The winters are the months during the time we have the higher amount of rainfall. They want to store that water and use that water for irrigation during the summer. So they are looking at crop production in a holistic way. They are looking into the system approach, adopting different strategies that allow them to increase efficiency to ensure that they are going to have this food on the table available for the consumers and show the consumers, yes, we are producing these uh, under environmentally sound strategies. Those are Alabama farmers. 
Conservation tillage is uh, basically where we maintain a maximum amount of residue on the soil surface with minimal disturbance below ground. Uh, so that way we promote soil residue, the beneficial effects of soil residue uh, to provide organic matter benefits and erosion control and so forth. From a conservation tillage standpoint, when you're talking about irrigation or even any uh, rainfall event or anything, you're going to be increasing the uh, efficiency of that event. So therefore you give some protection, you provide yourself some protection against short-term drought stress. The reason is when you have conservation tillage, you're generally going to improve your soil structure. Therefore you decrease erosion and any runoff that may be occurring with that erosion is actually going to be going into the soil profile where the plants can actually use it much more effectively. So in that case, you know, uh, that's where the short-term drought stress comes in. And in the case of an irrigation event, uh, maybe you can cut out an irrigation. Let's say you were, your crop, you needed to irrigate it six times over the growing season, perhaps you could irrigate it five times. So therefore you save the money, uh, you save the resource and so forth. So it, that's how it improves uh, efficiency. Uh, when we first started out, we didn't have much information on it and it moved in, I guess, in probably about the mid 70s, mid 1970s. And we had several problems that was developing and that we did not have we had, well, rather we had problems with plant stands because the planters we had available to us at the time would not cut through a mulch and put the seed in contact with the soil. And so we wound up with poor plant stands. We also had, uh, along the same line, issues with cover crops. Uh, we didn't know which cover crops to use, so uh, how much mulch to accumulate, when to take a cover crop out, when to plant it, or how to fertilize it. We also had uh, issues with uh, soil compaction. We had a uh, a surface soil compaction in some of our deep south Alabama soils that created problems we had to work around. And then we had uh, fertilizer issues. Uh, over the years we had always put fertilizer on the soil surface and then cut it in to the 8 inch depth with a moldboard plow. And uh, now we've changed the conservation tillage where we don't disturb the soil or don't disturb it very deeply over a wide area. And so all the fertilizer is on top. So now all of our fertilizer curves and recommendations uh, we're based on an 8 inch soil sampling depth where previous fertilizers have been mixed with the top 8 inches of soil and now we're putting them on the top of the soil and some of them don't move very deeply in the soil. So we had to work around all those concepts and how do we change it, how do we make recommendations and how do the farmers apply the fertilizer were the issues we had to work through on that. And then uh, finally we had uh, problems with weed control. Uh, we didn't have the herbicides then that we have now. We had no herbicides that we could spray over the top of, the, of a, a soybean crop, for example, and kill all the weeds and not harm the soybeans. So back then we only had two or three herbicides that we could use, and we only had one that we could use prior to planting, and that was Paraquat. All those were issues we had to work around to really get um, the growers to accept the practice and, and to start using it. Now the big changes over the years that has made a big difference and, and one is planter development. The planters you see now will cut through a heavy mulch and give us a good soil seed contact that we need to get adequate stands. Uh, we've had uh, great development in terms of the of herbicides, uh, a bigger selection of, of usable herbicides. And at the same time, the genetic engineers and the plant breeders have done an excellent job of getting the genes in the right place in the plant so we can use some of these selective herbicides. So that's been the issues that's really helped us out. And the benefit in the end the benefit in the end of this is uh, conservation for both water quality and soil quality and soil health. We keep our soil in the field, we keep our water in the field, and we keep our sediments out of the rivers and creeks. And that's the, the, I think that's the key issues we're dealing with here. Changes you see were, were developed by the farmers themselves, looking for ways to, to, to make it work. When they first started, when the growers first started growing conservation tillage, they were not necessarily thinking about water quality or soil quality. They were thinking about profitability. They wanted to improve profits. So they were looking at different ways uh, to, to make money or to increase profits. And there's several ways you can do it, uh, increase profits. You can do it by increasing yields or you can do it by reducing production costs. The old tillage systems would, would take about seven or eight trips across the field from the time you started preparing the soil to the time you harvested it. Whereas in the conservation tillage system, you're only making two or three trips across the field. And, 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 and the, the equipment, uh, and that's why the farmers went to it, looking at, looking at uh, the, the, the benefits of, of production costs, reduced production costs. 
and then the conservation was a, was a side effect that they really appreciate too. They like to, they, they want to keep their soil in their fields and they want to keep the water in the fields. So they, yes, they want the, the water quality and the soil conservation, but the driving point was a more profitable way to grow, to grow a crop. So I think what we're looking for in agriculture and, and the food sector are, are that next generation of scientists and that next generation of leaders who can help us innovate and, and solve some of the really pressing problems we face. You know, we often talk about the, the growing population we have in this world. We're going to see easily within my lifetime population grow to 9 billion in this world. And we're going to have to think about how we uh, provide food and fiber to that population very likely on uh, less land resources and land resources that may be degraded and water, less water and water resources that may not be as, as robust as they are today. So we've got some real challenges and if you're a type of student who wants to make a difference in the world, I think we've got a place for you in the College of Agriculture.